of code. Uh, it's my GitHub. You can see it. Uh, I also contribute a little bit to core here and there when I get time. Uh, I also run NodeConf, which is a conference about Node.js. Uh, this will happen in July, and tickets should be on sale towards the end of the month. And uh, yeah, you can ask me questions about that later if you like. But let's get started. This is a talk about the first Node program that I ever wrote, and actually how that changed over time. Um, and this talk is really good at showing you where Node's priorities are and how we think about how to solve a lot of programming problems. So let's get started. So in December of 2009, uh, this guy, Jan Lernhart, who's a great friend of mine, uh, ran a conference. He ran a conference called uh, JSConf EU, which is the European version. By European, he means Berlin version of uh, JSConf. And that was where Ryan Dahl gave his first kind of public talk about Node.js and where most people first heard about it. It's where I first heard about it. And he had already posted that video and I was really interested. And Jan said on Twitter, has anybody written an actual HTTP proxy in Node yet? I kind of want to play with this idea, but I don't want to write the proxy from scratch. Um, and I had written this thing in, in Python called Windmill. I'd spent about three years on it. It's a, a competitor to Selenium that didn't win. That's why you haven't heard about it. Uh, <laughs> but, it but it was... Uh, it, it, it was very, very smart. It, it had a proxy inside of it that would actually trick the browser into thinking that it never left the same domain. It would return forwards to content at the same domain and figure out where it should actually be proxying. It was crazy. I spent a lot of time on it, and because we wanted our tests to run fast, um, I spent most of my time optimizing it. And by the time that I was done, it was over 10,000 lines of code. It used a better HTTP client. In, in addition to that, I had a bunch of fixes on top of it to make it thread safe. I had thread two so that we could maybe try to kill Python reliably. Um, and we even had a special socket server so that we could do SSL fanciness. Um, so I knew a little bit about running an HTTP proxy, and I figured this would be a good thing. I'm going to try out this Node.js thing. I already know JavaScript. I was working at Mozilla at the time, so it's kind of a requirement. Um, and so two hours later, I had some code. Uh, and this is what, in December of 2009, an HTTP proxy looked like in Node. Uh, <laughs> the first half of this slide is pretty much just parsing URLs, because we don't have an URL parser yet. Nobody's written one. So <laughs> that's what this code is about. It's a terrible URL parser, but it works. Um, then we instantiate uh, a client object, which is an HTTP client object. We pull off the headers. We add a host header to it. Um, and then we, we call a method on that client object for the HTTP method. That's why we do this client request .method to lowercase so that we can match the, the output method from the input method. And then we give it the path and the headers. Then we listen for these body events that give us chunks, and then we call this send body thing. Um, and then we give a function to this finish call. This is not an event. This is a special call that takes a callback for finishing. Um, and we also have to do a lot of stuff around encoding. Um, in the early days, Node had to deal with string encoding about as much as you have to in other platforms, which is to say a lot. Uh, and we, we had this way to do, the way that you did binary in Node was actually through these binary encoded strings. So you had to be really careful about when you used them and when you didn't use them. Um, in the really early days back then, there were actually bugs where the data would mutate if you changed it to a binary encoded string, and it, even if that was the input, it, or if the input was asking you formatted into a binary encoded string and then wrote it out that way, it would be different. It was a very bad bug. Um, so that's why we have this very fancy encoding handling here. Then we listen for complete, and we call the finish guy, and then we're kind of done. That's not a lot of code. That's significantly less code than my Python proxy. It can't possibly be faster, because this doesn't include all the crazy network optimizations that, that I know that you can do. I know that this returns the request iteratively, which is one of the bigger optimizations that I had in Python. But this is literally about a third to a half of the amount of code that it took just to do iterative responses in Python. Um, this isn't, you know, keeping a nice pool around of connections, so I decided to play around and test it a little bit, and it turns out that it was way faster than my Python proxy. Um, like, like, by several orders of magnitude. And it, it, was, it also used way less resources. I mean, way less memory, way less CPU. If I left it there on for days at a time, it wouldn't eat up my CPU randomly like my Python proxy did. And it was much easier to understand and reason about. So this was about the time that I decided that I wasn't going to write Python anymore. Um, I, I loved Python. I was one of the biggest advocates of Python. I loved the community. I, I loved everything about it. But 
my problems, the problems that I was dealing with, Python was not interested in solving. And where Node already was showed that they were more interested in that. So I made a decision that I just wasn't going to write Python anymore, which was problematic because I was kind of employed to write Python. Um, so had some discussions. Uh, but it worked out. Uh, and in February of 2010, we, we had a new release of Node. And all of a sudden, this proxy starts to look like this. So, hey, we have an URL module. Isn't that nice? That's way less code now. It's like a half a slide. Done. Um, we, we also have a, a request method on the client, which is much easier because now I can just pass a string as the method rather than calling a method method. Um, we, that really bad encoding bug in binary encoded strings is gone. Um, so we don't have a lot of the really, really fancy handling around encoding. We can just set the encoding as binary and use binary encoded strings everywhere. Also, the, the body event is gone, um, and the, the finish call is also gone. And you have a more unified, unified interface here around the client request object and the HTTP response object. So if you see here, like there's, they both have the same data events, and they, and they all have write methods, and they all have close methods. So things are just getting a little bit more unified around how you deal with things that emit and close data. OK, one more thing that I want to cover in this slide. Um, the string encoding, although we fixed this binary encoding, the, that uh, binary encoding problem, this still sucks. Like th this, this way of dealing with strings is really bad because what would happen is um, we would get data off of a socket. We would convert it into a string, which is like this binary encoded string. Um, and then we would end up just writing it back out to another socket half of the time or writing it to a file descriptor or something that we actually need to take it and then copy it again. So, and, and the, the two string conversion was big enough, much less like dealing with that. Also, at the time, V8 had um, a max heap size of about a gig. So once you hit the heap limit, it, all bets are off. It, it just spins up to 100% CPU and it was really terrible. So after this release and the next release, um, this kind of goes away. We deprecate this binary encoding of strings and we move to what are called buffer objects. And so buffer objects are an object in JavaScript that is basically a pointer to a static allocation of memory that's outside of V8's heap. So we don't convert to string anymore. When things come off of the network and come off of file descriptors, we stick them into this allotment of memory that's not in V8's heap, um, and then we pass around a reference to that. And it's much faster. It got us out of a lot of heap problems. Um, and we don't suffer extra copies when we're just taking things from one file descriptor to another. OK, so July of 2010. Ryan, had, Ryan Dahl, the creator of Node, had been talking a lot about um, unifying the interface around file descriptors and sockets and even system processes. There are all these things that we deal with that sort of iteratively emit data and you can write data to them or sometimes you can't. So you have these readable objects and these writable objects. We have them all over Node. Why don't we, why don't we unify the API around them so that you can just write this function. Like, it, it should probably look like this. And there's just this function, and it can take two, two of these objects and just send them. So in this release of Node, um, I put in some code into Sys. Sys was a module where we just put stuff that we didn't really have a good place for. Um, and and this, this method takes two stream objects. It takes a readable stream and then a writable stream. And it takes all the data from one and sends it to another. And when one finishes, it calls end on the other object. So that removed all of the code in this proxy that had to deal with listening for write events and calling end. All of that's gone now because we have this much more unified interface. Awesome stuff. Um, wow, we're getting rid of so much code that we can do like comma first and we just have room and fits on a slide. This is beautiful. So uh, one of the nice things that, that you see at the top here is that we don't have that create client call anymore. Um, in this release of Node, we actually got rid of the create client call and just switch right to getting a request. Because it was kind of silly. You would create this client object and then you would create another object off of that for the client request, um, which is just, you know, that's the object that you care about. Why don't we just get you right to that? So this gets smaller here. Uh, and also, we, we deprecated the sys module. It turns out that if we can't think of a good place for it, it either doesn't belong in Node or we haven't spent enough time thinking about where to put it. So, we put a pipe method, it's now called pipe instead of pump, um, on all readable streams. So every readable stream in Node has this method on it called a pipe, and you pass in a writable argument to it. Much easier. This is all getting very, very small. So then in July of 2001, another release of Node came out. And I got in uh, one line in the core in that release. 
um, which is probably like the best line ever in Node. Uh, all that line does is at the end of the uh, pipe call, it emits an event on the writable stream called pipe, uh, and it passes in the readable argument. So now, when streams are piped to each other, each one knows about its input and output because one of them, the method is actually on the readable stream object, so it can intercept and, and figure out what the writable argument is. Um, and the other one gets an event, so it knows what its readable argument was. So now we can start to do really fancy things about the input and output of streams. They're, they don't have to be opaque, they can actually mean something. So uh, in my library request, which is this high-level HTTP library client that everybody's using, I just added in proxying support. So now if you create a request object to an URL uh, and you pipe in a server request object and you pipe it to a response object, or you can just do one of them or the other actually, um, it'll inspect the inputs and outputs and actually call the right methods and take the headers and the method and all the other information from the input and output and do what you want to do with it. So now the proxy is down to three lines. And that may seem unfair comparing it to the old Python proxy, but remember, I was actually using a third-party HTTP client in that library as well. Um, so then in November of 2011, we added one more thing into Node uh, that was the last thing that's, that's affected this code um, all the way till today. It's that pipe returns the destination stream. So when you pass in a writable stream to pipe, it will return that same writable stream at the end which means that now this, one, this proxy is actually one line. So we went from two slides down to essentially one line uh, in a couple years. I mean, it did take a while. But this is, these are the problems that we're focused on. Like, we're not focused on using all of your cores to do Fibonacci. We really don't care. Like, that's not a thing that we worry about. What we worry about is how do you write better network programs? Uh, how do you remove boilerplate, how do you make things more predictable and simpler to read, and that's what we're doing. So that's the end of that talk. I have another talk now, because my talks are very short. Okay. All right, this is the module tour. This is what was actually on the program. So this is what you paid for. All right, um, that's me again. And why am I going to talk about third-party modules? So most, I know that I just spend a lot of time talking about advances that we make in core, but a lot of the value, the vast majority of the value really in Node is being created by the community and third-party modules. So it's more important to know about the really good modules, the modules that you can take for granted, not necessarily the really opinionated modules or the ones that you know, like are going to get replaced in a month with something better or you know, are going to get abandoned because Tim Castle wrote them. Like, this is just for the module. <laughs> this is, like, I'm just going to talk about the modules that are solid enough now that you can just take them for granted. OK. So yeah, NPM, everybody uses NPM. It, it is the best package manager ever. Um, really, it is. I've used package managers in every system, and I've never seen one this nice. Um, I checked today. We are over um, 8,800 packages in the registry. We grow by between 50 and 100 a day. Uh, and we get about two to 300 updates of packages a day to existing packages. Um, OK, so really simple stuff like, yeah, you can do npm install express. That's really simple. Um, but there's some other stuff that like, I didn't know about until Isaac showed me. So let's do npm explore request. Oh, by the way, like, this is my slides directory, and I have some node modules installed in here. So npm explore request. Yeah, 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 it's ESH. OK, whoa. OK, so what this does is it runs a new shell in whatever directory resolves to that module. So wherever you have that module installed, if in your node program at that same level you can require it, this command will drop you into a new shell that's in that directory. So this is really nice because um, if the request module has the same dependency that I have at the top level and they're two different versions, it'll actually be getting two different versions of those because we don't have global versions um, in packages. So in this directory, if I wanted to do node, I could actually now require something that, not, request has no dependencies, so that won't work, but whatever. Um, I, I could check you know, what is that dependency and, and does that have a bug in it and all that kind of stuff. And then when I'm done, I can just control D out and then I go back to my old shell. So that's really useful. Um, 
this is cool. So there's a ton of hidden little config gems everywhere, and this is one of them. You can set your viewer to browser, um, and then if you do npm help, it'll open in the browser. <laughs> um, that's cute. Okay, npm list. This is one of the most useful ones ever. So this is great. None of them are colored. Like, let me, mm, yeah, yeah, whatever. Um, uh, get. Okay, pretend that you didn't see any of this code. Okay, awesome. So this is much cooler. This is like all of these crazy dependencies. Look, I have an unmet dependency in there. I have a bunch of dependencies that are actually aren't necessary because they aren't dependent on anywhere else in the tree. They're just installed probably because they were installed back when it did require it, but now it doesn't require it in the package JSON anymore. It's like a really, really useful tool. Um, and you see here, this is like just really simple. It shows me all the dependencies of my dependencies as well. So you can see the socket IO actually requires quite a bit of stuff. I mean, it requires its own client, which in turn requires a couple different modules. Okay, that's enough NPM. Oh no, wait, I lied. So this is actually, it's okay. I wrote this in like a weekend, so bear with me. This page kind of sucks. You can uh, search for stuff though, like flow. Give it a second. Maybe it's broken. <laughs> it's probably broken. All right. So yeah. That's probably actually because it's a big CouchDB view and nobody uses search, so every time that I hit this, I'm like the first person in a week and it has to regenerate the view. Um, okay, you can see, that the most useful thing is probably this guy here, this most dependent on. So these are the modules that like, for all intents and purposes, everybody's using. Uh, you can see that everyone really does use underscore. It's incredibly useful. Um, not like 500 packages are written in CoffeeScript. So 500 packages require CoffeeScript. Um, that number gets a little bit skewed because like everybody who ever does anything in CoffeeScript has to require this. All right, moving along. Optimist Prime. Okay, um, Optimist is awesome. All right. This is Optimist. Uh, this is written by Substack. Most modules you will use end up being written by Substack. Um, he is somewhat prolific. It's a very simple option parser that does all the things that you need in a really simple package. Um, you can see here that you require Optimist and then it's just gonna automatically parse the process.args, but it's not gonna overwrite the process.args because that would be evil. All it's doing is providing you with the new argv. And we can see there that I didn't pass it anything, so it doesn't get very much stuff. But then, like, oh, I can actually get stuff. And then, and then like, f that, and then do, 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 equals no, 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 no. There we go. See, lots of useful parsing. And it sort of handles, like, every weird parse case that you would want to do. Like, I can do, you know, I think this works. Yep, see, that works. OK. You can write your own usage, which is very nice. Um, and you can also demand that certain things are required. So like, let's run 2.js. OK. That console.log call never happened. And it printed the usage and the required arguments because I didn't give it some of the required arguments. Very, very simple stuff. But if I go ahead and give it those, it'll actually run to that. Very simple. Whoops. Okay. All right. Uh, we can also set defaults, just same defaults around options, so that when I run 3.js, those will be there. Um, okay. Uh, this is a really simple script. This counts the lines in a file. It demands that you give f. It aliases f to file, which is incredibly useful. Um, and then it will describe the option for you. And if I don't give it, it's actually it prints really, really useful and uses information. So it describes the file thing. It says that it's aliased to this other guy and it says that it's required. So if I give that, let's give that dash dash file equals 
4.js. 17 lines are in that file. Very interesting. OK. Uh, now we're moving into request. OK, so I wrote this library. I think it's awesome. Uh, some other people seem to think so. It's very well used and depended on. Um, Node has a very, very good HTTP client in it already. It's very good, it's very complete. I know I've worked on it a lot. Um, it's just a little bit verbose and it's a little bit hard to do really simple things. You end up writing a lot of lines to do things like buffering the response. Um, and there's just a lot of little tiny features in HTTP and the client that you just want to support, you know, like cookies or you want to do like proxying like we saw earlier. So I'll show you some of the things that you can do with this higher order HTTP client. So let's get Google. This is going to take forever. Um, and then we're going to print the entire body, which comes in uh, as an argument to the callback. And then we're going to wait for AT&T. All right. There we go. There's lots of minified JavaScript all over Google.com. So that was really easy and useful. Show me more. OK. All right, here we go. Here we're, um, we're gonna take the URL for the Google Doodle, uh, hilarious, and uh, we're gonna write it to a file. So all we do is we request that URL and then we pipe that object, the request object, to a new fs.write stream, which is the core file writer object with that new image path. This will take a little while to run too, because images are big. Okay, and oh, there's the doodle. And let's open it and make sure that it works. Yes, it does. You don't care about the continental breakfast at the caterer that I'm thinking about? All right. <laughs> uh, okay, that was great. All right, here we go. Now we're gonna take uh, the doodle that we just wrote to the file system. Um, and then we're getting this, this new guy here, this new file URL. Um, and then we're gonna write this little HTTP server that opens a write stream to Google 2 and writes whatever the input is to a file. And then at the end of the file, it's gonna do this response. This is just standard sort of node HTTP server stuff. And so we create a read stream of the Google Doodle and we pipe that to a request.put call. So this is actually taking the body of the image and piping it to the server. And the server's just gonna write it out to a file so we can make sure that it worked correctly. Everybody get that? Good, okay, awesome. You are all network programmers. Oh, I also printed this stuff. That was really, fa oh yeah, because it's all on my local system. Things are much faster when you don't go through AT&T's network. Hey, it works, everything's fine. Another nice thing um, that you can see here is that I just closed the server after the end of the, the first call here. Node would have stayed open indefinitely if I just would have listened and not closed it. Uh, but also, when nothing is left in Node's event system, it just exits cleanly. It's really useful. Um, okay. Especially if you've dealt with Python. Python's like impossible to make it just close, just stop. Um, it really hates it. Okay. So this is similar, but what we're gonna do here is we're actually gonna get the Google Doodle again from Google, then we're gonna pipe the call that we get to a new request.put object to that same bit of code that was writing to the file system. This is useful um, in Node because like, you'll notice that all of these objects are stream objects. They're all gonna get data as it comes off of the network. They're not gonna keep more than one chunk ever in memory. Like because we're piping all of this data, as soon as this chunk comes in and gets emitted, it's just gonna get written out to wherever it needs to go. This is how Node handles so many in-flight connections. It's not just that you know, it's asynchronous and that it uses ePoll, it's that in your application, you don't keep around more data than you need. You just pass it off to the next file handler. All right, that's number eight. I'm sure you believe that these work, but I'm just gonna run them anyway so that you know that I know how to write code. Watch it fail, okay. See, this is a very interesting thing about this one. This had way more headers in it because what we ended up doing here was taking this get call 
And then we piped the, the request object to another request object that's doing a put. So it actually took all of the response headers and used them as write headers, which is super useful because this means that if you take data from a web service and then you write it to another web service, it's gonna keep the content type intact and it's gonna keep the content length intact and all those other nice good headers that make everything more useful. I got a sign, I don't know how much time that means. How much time? Five minutes, five minutes, okay. You believe, oh no, this one's really cool though. Okay, this is the one line proxy that we showed earlier, but you can see that it actually works. One, three, three, seven. God, I'm a dork. <laughs> really? You're in offline mode, so you can't talk to local hosts? You retarded? <laughs> All right, there we go. See, look, we can talk to Google. <laughs> uh, this is all being proxied locally. Awesome stuff. Good times. Um, okay, now we're on to new cool hotness. Socket IO. Socket IO is the new hotness because real time's the new hotness. This is a really nice trick. You take an idea that already exists, like bake sales, and then you add real time to it, and then your real time bake sales. And then you go to a VC and you get millions of dollars. <laughs> Um, oh, we should look at this code, it's actually kind of complicated. Okay, so we have this HTML page and this JavaScript. This is our server. Um, all it does is it serves up this 10.html as the index if you get on slash. And then uh, it also sets up a socket IO that listens on that server. And for every connection that comes in, it actually takes the process.standard in output and writes it to the WebSocket. So that's some crazy magic. And then here all we do is we set up a new socket IO client, we take all the data, and we write it to the console. And we also write it to this um, element right here. So let's run that guy. Hope that it works. Okay. Did I do 337 again because I'm a dork? Yes, I did. Ghost. Ah. Okay. There we go. Come on, guy. I did this last time. Oh, there it goes. See, now it's sending the actual data. I don't know why there was, oh, there's a lag in process.handling. That's what the problem is. Hey, it wrote it. And it's really happening in real time, I promise. Oh, it's already there. Okay. <laughs> it's really hard to show on one screen everything that's happening. Oh, you know what? I could just do this. This is what windowing was made for. Oh, look at how fast that is. Right. Okay, now I have about 40 seconds for questions. So you can ask a question, but the answer has to only take 40 seconds. You. Okay, so the question is, um, can he take a response, pass it to a function, and then pass that to another web service? And the answer is yes, but there, there is one caveat. So in all the examples that I showed, um, we didn't do anything in between taking the data and just sending it off. Like we, we inspected the data and did stuff with it, but right away we wrote it. Um, if you're taking in input in a stream, and then you wanna go off and ask a question over IO, like you wanna ask a question to Redis, that stream is already emitting data. It's already gonna be emitting data, and you need to buffer that um, if you wanna send it off to another web service, off in the future whenever that other callback happens from that IO action. So that's the only added complexity when you add in a callback. Um, like an in, in application layer callback. I assume that the callback is to go off and do I.O. because you've just had a callback for no reason. Um, 
but yeah, that's that's a problem that we're actually dealing with. Um, in a future version of Node, uh, streams will when you open a stream, it will open in a pause state, and when you pause it, it will emit it won't emit data. So you'll be able to just pause that stream, and it'll hold on to the data until you give it off to the next input. So we're we're working on making that easier, so that you don't have to buffer by hand. But all of the really popular web frameworks right now, I mean, my framework Taco, Express, like most people that have to deal with this problem, they have some sort of buffering built in. Production high performance load balancing. I mean, I use it in production. Uh, Substack uses it in production. All of Node Jitsu's ho hosting platform uses Node for their load balancer in production. Um, I mean, you get different order. You get different performance depending on what your load looks like. Um, Node Jitsu's proxy is it's all open source, but they do a lot of fancy stuff. I mean, they do a lot of rewriting of headers and. So they don't get as many concurrent connections as I do. I, I have a pure TCP proxy that sits behind stud and just round robins to all of my, like, everything behind the scenes. So I get, like, 10 times as many concurrent connections as they do. Um, but yeah, I mean, you definitely can do it. Many people do do it in production. Thank you. All done. Awesome. Thank you.